So this is kind of the specification of this thing. <coughs> Similarly, we can do the husband, and we can do the, um, and we have everything. We've got three probabilities there. The wife, the husband, and the husband. The joint distribution is just the product of all these three potentials. So you multiply potentials together. I call them potentials just because this is a more general phrase and distribution which we will use later. Um, it's a multiplication of these three potentials. And that defines then a, a distribution of all these three variables. It contains all the information required to do the multiplications. <coughs> so what we could do then is I could say, well, I could define, for example, the marginal distribution on the husband and wife variable just by summing this potential, marginal, marginalizing it, this joint distribution, this joint potential, over the states of the variable income. That's basically the definition of marginal. Similarly, I could define the marginal, say, for the husband, it would be the marginal of this marginal summed over <coughs> the wife variable. And similarly, the, the wife would be the sum of the marginal of husband and wife over the husband variable, etc. Now what I could do is I want to check whether or not these are independent. I want to know whether or not the product of these two marginal distributions is equal to this marginal distribution. So if it is, then they're independent. So the product of these two is the multiplication of these two potentials. And then I can just look at the tables. I can just see whether or not um, the product table pH times by PW is what's that looking like. So I'll just run this down and <coughs> Table, is it BRML array? And um, 
games of three variables, these are the variables number one, two, three, in this case. This table is a four by four by two double array. Why is that? Because, well, there were four states of the husband's card, there were four states of the wife's card, and there were two states of income. So this is sort of a four by four by two array, not a, not a matrix anymore, but a, a three-dimensional array. And in general, we'd have an n-dimensional array for <coughs> slices through this three-dimensional array. Okay. So that's it. So you know you could um, this package is quite nice, the this is what's called op operator overloading. So you know you could define a probability distribution. Let's say um, let's see, uh, P equals uh, array. This is what's a little while since I've used this but let's see how it works. Say I define a distribution, right? So P. Uh, P is an array, so it's going to be a discrete array. And at the moment there are no variables in the no table, so let me specify the variables at the table. So let's say P dot variables, let's call it so no, it's number one. Right? So let's say P dot table <coughs> equals say 0.2, 0.7, So this is a probability distribution, as it some looks. That's a probability distribution. Oh, okay. um, we can see that maybe we could check. So we could say, well, what is the sum of this potential of P? <coughs> it's, uh, this, in this case, it's a constant uh, on an array. So we return to a new object. Which doesn't have any variables anymore. It's just summed over all the variables. It's a the table bound entry one. You could do um, you know p plus p. It would be a strange thing to want to do in probability, but you could do that. It's another array. It's still got the variables one, and it's got table entry, which is going to be um, say ten plus eight. <coughs> Somebody, somewhere you find uh, an operator to tell me what to do with the star symbol, or tell me what to do with this plus symbol. That's defined, in this case, in a corresponding intuitive way. So let's do another thing. Let's say, let's define another, let's define two variables. Let's say, um, let's say uh, P1. <coughs> Probabilities, two probability distribution. Let's say P1 is an array. Um, and the P1 variables <coughs> are, say, variable 1. And P1 of the table is, say, let's go for the same one before, say, um, whatever it was, 0.2, 0.7, 0.1. Space. Again, I don't know. Let's say P1 Right, so that, that's one array. With the distribution. Let's do another one. Let's say um, P2 is an array as well. Let's say P2 dot the variables. Let's say, just call it just say 2, right? So it's a very useful variable 2. Let's say P2 dot table. Let's say there were only two states of variable 2. And let's call it say 0.6 so now I have two distributions, P of x1 and P of x2. And I could form a joint distribution, say P is say P1 times P2. What would that be? It should be a distribution on variables 1 and 2, and have the 
was on a two by two tape, two, two a three by two tape. Okay, so that's a that's a table. You can look at that table. So what is it going to look like? This is a joint distribution over, over these two particles. Uh, hopefully this sums to one. Let me check that. So <coughs> what is the sum potential P over variables uh, number two? It's one. It's one. You could ask, you know, is it, are x1 and x2 independent of this distribution? <coughs> they should be because you know by the construction of Certainly, uh, you sort of check that. You say, well, you know, what is the uh, let's call it uh, temp one is the sum of this joint distribution p. Let's say the variable two. That's right. So that's the sum of the margin of the two. So this is the distribution of the variable one. And similarly, you could do uh, say some let's call it the sum of temp two is the could say, well, what is you know, t1 times t2 going to look like? Some distribution. And I could then check, say, t3 is this. t3 dot table is that. And t <coughs> that's equal to uh, t4. Uh, t4 dot to this kind of graphical description here. This is going to be the first uh, sort of part of the graph theoretic notation. Okay, so, um, so that's it. So we start to get familiar with this uh, these kinds of toolbox uh, issues. I mean, there, there are many different ways of doing this, of course. It's, uh, the, I just encourage you to use this one. You've got uh, maybe you have your own preferences as well, but So in principle, you shouldn't find any problems if you have problems downloading it or unzipping it. It's something to do with your particular format. You know, it's been downloaded many, many thousands of times. So if there's something going wrong, it's probably, it's probably nothing to do with me. <laughs> <laughs>
Is the data set the office of experiment, for example, or data technical science? And you may have some parameters or something that you want to fit or estimate based upon that data set. So in a, in a probabilistic setting, what you're interested in is, in the data set D, I want to know something about theta. What is P is that to give me? This is the kind of uh, quantity you want to access. So on base rule, we can write it this way. D of D give theta, plus by P, theta over P of D. And this is really interesting, because what this says is, well, if you knew what theta rate were, and you knew how the data should be generated given that theta, all you need to do is multiply by your prior beliefs that are the appropriate values in theta. And this P of D is just a normalization constant. And that is the answer. So what Bayes' law is, it's a, it's a kind of a framework actually for solving, answering the question of the science of how to infer anything from experimental data. And it says, this will be the, the experimental term here. This is your prior belief term. So maybe I'll give you an example. Let's imagine that you, you want to say, estimate the, the gravitational acceleration. So we could take a, you know, a kilo or something, whatever it is, there's only just not too much friction, you could drop it a meter and see how far it goes in a meter. This would be um, an estimate then of the G gravitational acceleration. Um, but you know, it's going to vary, actually, we will not be fixed throughout the, the Earth. It's going to be some thing, you know, it's going to, depending on if there's a large mountain around or Water bodies, etc. It will, it will vary slightly from the sort of the, the standard accepted figure of G. So you might say, well, you know, I'm pretty confident that the G, my theta, the parameter theta in that case, which is going to be the G, you know, is around about here, 9.8. But it might have some, you know, I might be prepared to accept that there could be some fluctuation around that point. This is just my, <coughs> my prior belief in what I think is the appropriate value for the based upon intuition, other aspects of science, personal preference, previous observations, previous experience. Okay. Now, if you knew though what G were, and we assume that Newton's laws are going to hold reasonably well, then you know actually what length of time you should measure. So if I knew that the gravitational constant is 9.8 meters per second squared, then in one second it should have dropped 9.8 meters, right? That's what the answer says. So what this would say here, what's the probability that the data, the time, given theta, well, <coughs> theta 9.8, then I should not give time, the data should be, that I'll observe 9.8 seconds. But you might say, well, I have a, you know, I have a little bit of a, um, <coughs> I can't measure this thing exactly, you know, I might just not observe the job, you know, it's like it's late, you know. So maybe actually there's a distribution around that as well, you can only measure that time with certain accuracy. So you might have, for example, I'm going to jump a little bit to continuous variables now, but there would be just for this motivational example. You might have say something that looked like so the probability of given time given theta might be something like this, so time minus theta over some so the sigma is the kind of the variance of standard deviation and of your measurement device. You might be able to only measure it down to zero point not millisecond or something like that, so you might understand the deviation of one millisecond, or whatever it is from, that you know from the characteristics of your measuring apparatus. So now, uh, what this baseball says is that's it. You basically, you encoded uh, Newton's laws here. That's what Newton says. This is an encoding of that subject to measurement error. So it's a generative model of the world. If you knew the truth, how would the truth generate the observed data? Subject to potentially some uh, noise. 
this is your product, I think you might have say some gas situation, might say, well, you know, I think a brewery uh, eater is going to be Gaussian around 9.8, which is like squared. But say um, some characteristic, say gamma squared, <coughs> standard deviation. And then it says, well, okay, if that's true, you, you measured at your time, say it was 9.9 meters per second squared, what's the posterior distribution in theta for this particular model? The posterior distribution in theta, given t is 9.9, is equal to the product of these two, proportional to the product of these two things. So it would be proportional to e to the minus 9.9 uh, uh, minus uh, No, never mind, but it doesn't matter too much. The point is that if I want to multiply these two <coughs> distributions together, and this will give me a posterior distribution for it. Okay. And there's some continuous variable going on here, but this is a way that we can then use the experimental data in combination with our kind of beliefs to figure out what we think is a good estimate for posterior. But isn't the product we need to be a bit subjective? It is subjective. But if whatever you take for product B, even if you take the uniform distribution, it's subjective in the sense that you consider everything possible? Um, not necessarily. You could put a zero probability on here. It's up to you. You could say, I, I think it's impossible to have a negative value. Okay, you can bound it. Yeah. But you're right, it's subjective. and. We make no, as a, we celebrate that fact. So in this in this framework, there is no such sense of objectivity. It's, it's, there is always an element of subjectivity. It's not absolutely objective. But this is philosophical. I'm not going to get into it too much. But um, if you believe in probability and the definition of conditional probability. Inescapable that you have this formulation there. So if you believe in this stuff, you have to specify a prior. So there's independent data, and this is inherently to some degree subjective. And we celebrate that fact. All of this framework, what it requires you to do is to fully declare your subjective views. And then if other people don't like that, they can argue about it, discuss it. But that it, it, it forces you to explicitly rather than in other frameworks which are which don't do that. So this is considered actually an advantage. Is it robust? In what sense robust? Prior uh, different prior beliefs can give a uh, much different posterior yes. distribution. general formalism for solving problems in science. It's, it's becoming the dominant philosophy in science. It's not circulated everywhere, but uh, most of the more numerically competent uh, branches of science are using this uh, And indeed, this was the original, actually, definition of was a kind of uh, momentary aberration. <laughs> okay. So anyway, that's the big... Uh, so how does it... This, uh, this is an important thing. Um, these things have got names. <coughs> so, so this thing is called the posterior. This P of D given feature is called the likelihood. P of D is called the prior. P of D itself, which is the sum and the marginal of the joint distribution over theta, is un un unhelpfully called the evidence. Uh, so it's also sometimes called the marginal likelihood, or also sometimes called the model likelihood. There's a lot of different terminologies for that. I don't like the term evidence, I'm afraid, at all. Um, and you 
may have a competing set of models that may ex explain your interpretation. So, for example, you might say, well, you know, this gravitational thing didn't take general relativity into account. You know, we need to, to do that. Special relativity. That's not Newton's laws are in the end, just an approximation. So, you might say, well, maybe depending on what you're doing, each of those has a different likelihood. And you might say, you know, which is the preferred model? Einstein's, or what is the best fit? Well, you can then have these things. So, well, given the Einsteinian model or the Newtonian model, you've got a way of generating the data. This is your generative model here. And that's, sorry, this is the posterior. And you can have a generative model here. You can have a prior for a specific model. And this, again, this is a normalization term here. So, you might say things like, well, you know, uh, that's great, you can carry these things out. I can, I can compute these posterior distributions for my set of competing models. And then I can, and then actually this framework itself, it, it, it finishes there. The framework says nothing more than that. It doesn't say how you should interpret this in, in any other sense. It's, uh, it's just about distributions and manipulations of distributions. One thing though that uh, is often done, and there's nothing in the framework which says you should do this, is you may say, well, I would like, say, for the Newtonian model, maybe to find, say, the most likely parameter for that Newtonian model. What is the single most likely value of theta? But bearing in mind, we have a posterior distribution of possible theta. So we started with this prior distribution. What's going to happen is that it's typically, in the, in the light of the observed data, this posterior distribution will be a little bit shifted, a little bit focused around a value which is consistent with the observations that and you might say, well, from this distribution, I want to find the most likely single theta, which would explain the data. It would be posteriori most likely by the single value of theta. So the summarization of the posterior distribution, the map summarization, that's the maximum of this thing, which is equivalent to um, <coughs> You might say, well, uh, you know, this whole prior business is, uh, I, don't know, I don't know what to do with that. Uh, so I just set it to constant. And if you do that, then this theta, the posterior thing here, which is, uh, because of this normalization constant, is equivalent to the maximization of this, which itself is given by the product of p of d and theta times by p of theta. If p of theta is a constant, this means that this optimal theta, single optimal theta, is equivalent to that theta which maximizes the likelihood. So the classical maximum likelihood um, method, for the better word, is uh, if you like, in this framework, it corresponds to assuming a constant flat prior, and you are summarizing the posterior distribution very aggressively taking the single most likely explanation. There's no reason in this general framework to do either of those two things. So uh, that's one way to view that's the like the classic that's the like So this is all, you know, quite philosophical. And of course, you know, the clever bit in science is really specifying this, these terms here. You know, that's, about, that's where you get the Nobel Prize, right? You know, specifying their life. You don't get it. <coughs> anyway, so this is the general philosophy, and it's very attractive in some sense, but it can be very computationally difficult. So, in, in, uh, in effect, we'll often have very many parameters. Uh, these terms are difficult. We would have to work in uh, very high dimensional distributions or posterior distributions, and we often run into major computational difficulties, and we have to think about how to address that. And that's not something that we will discuss much in this course, but uh, you will do that in the Gatsby Part 2 course. And we will discuss a little bit of this, and we'll discuss all this, some of this also in the applied machine learning as well, so in the approximation. Okay, so here in the, th um, the intro to the probability, any questions before we move on?
so, you know, maths is a bit of a loaded word, unfortunately. I don't mean x, y plots. I mean these kind of graphs where you just know it's the vertices. So, the graph of nodes, these are uh, round objects, and the vertices are also called, and edges or links. Okay, I'll be a little bit schizophrenic, which terminology I'm going to take from here. So it's all just definitions, and here we've got a we've got a graph of uh, on nine sorry eight variables, and in this case this is a it's a mixed graph um, because some of these edges are directed, you know, they've got an arrow on them, and some of the graph the edges are undirected, they don't have a, an arrow on them. So these are undirected edges, these are direct edges here. So this um, so if these so a path is going to be a sequence of edges, either directed or undirected, uh, or a mixture of the two, and connected nodes starting from one to another. So for example, a path you know, might be something like, say, x1 to x5 to x8. That would be a path, connected nodes. Path, though, so x1 to x3 is not a path, because there's no direct connection. So paths here, all possible paths are things like uh, x2, x5, x7 as a path, x3, x5 itself as a path, uh, x3, x5, x8, x6 as a path, x3, x6 is not a path. So a directed graph has all of the edges or the uh, things, got arrows, they've all got arrows on them. And Furthermore, a special kind of graph is called a, a, an acyclic graph. What that means is that if you were to start at any node and you would follow the arrow directions, you will never come back on yourself. You'll never revisit a node twice. Revisit. So this one here, you know, you never, if you follow the arrow directions, you'll never come back to a So here, the only difference between this one and this one is that we've got an edge here, so you can start going around here in a loop. So you can start revisiting nodes here. There are paths which contain revisited nodes. So that's not acyclical, it's a cyclical one. It's cycle stuff. <coughs> so there are some fairly um, obvious notational definitions here. Parents and children, let's stick with uh, the DAG, direct acyclic graph. So DAGs. So X is a parent, so it's pretty easy to do this thing. The parents of X5 are X1, X2, X3. The children of X5 are X7 and X8. What are the, um, what are the children of X3? X5. What are the parents of X3? Is the end set. So it's pretty obvious. Um, there's the other, the corresponding ancestors and descendants. So what are the, what are the ancestors <coughs> of X5? They're all of the parents and their parents, etc., which could have given rise to X5. So they're all the things which have a path which end in X5. So in this case, X1, X2, X3 are the ancestors of X5. Descendants of X5 are X4, X7, and X8. You have to call all of them. It's not just the immediate descendants or ancestors. Okay. And an undirected graph, then all the edges are undirected. Yeah. How does the um, parent children and ancestors descend in relationship work? Sorry, say that again. How does the um, the whole um, ancestral descendant relationship work in a cyclic? It doesn't. Right. Yeah. You just yeah. can't yeah. find. So the, these definitions here are. Um, mm -hmm. I'm going to. I will only discuss the the diag case, the cyclic the the case. There may be people who attempt to define these situations where there are cycles as well, but we don't need that here, so it won't be an issue. So if 
for an undirected graph, it just means there are no, you know, no edges. But in this case, you know, we don't have the con concept of um, parents and children, or ancestors and descendants. We have the concept of neighbors. So what is the neighbor of, what are the neighbors of x1? They are x2, x3, and x4. <coughs> Let's look at x2, x5, and x3 on the right. They're all connected to each other. So that's a clique. It's a three clique. This is what three variables are. Actually, also, x1, x2, x3, x4, they're all connected to each other. <coughs> so that's a four clique. You could say, well, x1, x2, and x3, they're also all connected to each other. So you could say that's a, a three clique. But that three clique actually is embedded in a larger clique. So this is a bit notational, uh, it depends which you know, textbook you read, but so there's a concept of a maximal clique. A maximal clique is the largest clique. So x1, x2, x3 is not a maximal clique, because it's embedded in a larger clique. x1, x2, x3, x4. That's the maximal clique. Okay, so sometimes, sometimes some people will create phrase, you know, this we say this is the maximal clique. So I'll tend to use, um, yeah, I'm going to be a little bit consistent. Generally, when I say clique, I mean maximum clique, although unfortunately there are other <coughs> uses of terminology and machine devices and things which somewhat a little bit to muddy the waters. Of the okay, so that's uh, undirected graphs. Uh, Connectivity. So a connected graph means that there's a path between any two vertices. So this, I mean, it's easy. this is not a connected graph because you, know, you can't get from X4 to X3 or you know, there's no way, there's no path between those particles. This is a, a graph of two connected components. These components are connected, but the graph itself is not connected. Okay? So you could discuss the connected components of the graph. the most important definition today in some sense, uh, except the base one. So a graph is either singly or multiply connected. So I'm talking about a connected graph. So what this means is that if, if a graph is singly connected, there's only one path between any pair of variables. So look, look, look at the top one. You know, if, you, if you say, what is a path between x1 and x5? Well, it's got to be x1, x3, x4, x2, x5. There's no other way. There's no other path. Certainly, if you say there was a path between x2 and x3, well, it's x2, x4, x3. There is no other path. It's only a single path that would be any pair of variables. Sorry, um, just regarding the definition of paths, so it means that you can traverse one node multiple times. That's right. Yeah. Well, you could make another path going x1, x3, yeah. x4, x3, x4, x2, x1. Yeah, we, we eliminate this, the redundance. Anything, yeah, we don't kind of have the redundance. Redundancy path, yeah. Um, so, on this graph though, if you say, which is multiple connected, you know, I want to go from x1 to x5, or I could go x1, x2, x5, or I could go x1, x3, x5, or in this case also x1, x4, x2, there's lots of ways to do it. If there's more than one way, it's multiply connected. Now this, it turns out that actually this connectedness here, the single or multiple connected uh, property, is actually really key to science. So it turns out that all Nobel Prize winning stuff is, is here. Well, this stuff there is all easy. You can't get a Nobel Prize for anything <laughs> just in the thing. It's really weird, but that's trivial. Well, 
this contains trivial things. And we will do a lot of trivial things. <laughs> of course. Um, but we, I will tell you how to deal with this case, and you will see um, that this is really interesting, and this is the a lot of you know the hard thinking of stuff is it's all in here. But the fundamental computational complexity of dealing with probability is related typically to the connectedness of the, the underlying graph representing the distribution. And we're going to be <coughs> using this and exploiting and manipulating these graphs to do probabilistic calculations. Okay, that's it for graph definitions. There's <coughs> a lot, but in your yeah, we won't use it all just now. Okay, so okay, so now we're going to look at introduce our first draft model. There are many kinds of draft models. This is probably maybe the most well known. Um, certainly in the last uh, 30, 40 years or so. Um, and it's maybe the most useful for one of the most useful for machine learning uh, purposes. And they're called belief networks. Or sometimes called Bayesian networks. Okay, so the way it's work, so we have, you know, we have distributions and we have these graphs. And how, how do these these things connected. So we need some ways of specification to relate a graph to a distribution. And the way that it works with belief networks is the following. Each node represents a variable in the graph in the distribution. And each link is associated with a uh, independence or dependent <coughs> statement. So the way to read this graph here is to say, okay, my distribution will have the variables A, B, C, D, and E. And I'll have corresponding factorization. I'll have a factor P of D given C. Right. I'll have a factor P of E given its parents, C and B. I'll have a node again P of C given its parents, A and B. So every term, every, every <coughs> node in this graph corresponds to a term in the distribution the probability of that variable given is parents. That's the semantics of the, the blue pattern. And sometimes the parental set would be empty. So for example, P of A given is parental set is just P of A. <coughs> and then you just multiply all of these factors together, these uh, initial probabilities together, and that's the joint distribution. Okay, that's the, the way the so I'll, gi I'll give you an example. We'll come back to later. Why is this a distribution? How do you how do you know this is a valid probability distribution? Let's explain that. But let's look at the. So let's go back to a modeling scenario, a very simple one again. So we've got four variables here: the alarm, the uh, so your vocal alarm. Um, use A for that. Um, whether or not it's sounding, you know, yes or no. Uh, whether or not you've been burgled, it has to be burgled. Whether or not there is an alarm, an earthquake warning on the radio. And whether or not, sorry, yeah. And, uh, and also whether or not there has been an earthquake. So the, the scenario is the following one that you, you're living in Los Angeles and you, you come home, you know, there's a lot of earthquakes in Los Angeles come home and you find that your burglar alarm is, is ringing, it's sounding. So, you know, I mean, it could be mean that you know, you've actually been burgled, or maybe the earthquake set off the, the burglar alarm. So maybe you can check on your car radio uh, if there's been a broadcast of an earthquake warning, in which case you, know, you might have <coughs> some more information about whether or not you've really been burgled. Right? So we're going to try to summarize our understanding of Los Angeles and burglaries and earthquakes all in this four variable probability. This is going to be our little universe. So they're all going to be binary variables. They're just going to take two states in this case. Uh, you know, yes or no. 
and true or false, whatever it would be. So alarm, verbal yes or no, alarm ringing yes or no, radio broadcast earthquake warning yes or no, positive earthquake yes or no, would not be verbal yes or no. Now, from Facebook, without loss of generality, I can write this joint distribution as this expression here, A given R and B times by A of R and B. This is just a definition of Facebook, which would say, basically will say this conditional distribution here is the joint distribution divided by whatever is on the right. So just rewriting that. I'm going to leave that term alone. I'm going to specialize in this term now. See if I can write that. R of EB is R given EB as by P of EB. Again, there's no loss of generality to do that. And simply EB group is E given B times B. So any, actually any four variable distribution can then be written in this factorized form without loss of any general, any, any distribution of four variables. It's always written like that. It's totally universal. And it's interesting, right? So what it says is that if you look at this, the R, A, R, E, and B, A, R, E, and B, single variables, and on the right, we've got sort of subsets of the other variables. So what we could do is if we say, well, this this is what we're doing. You know, we're going to specialize and specify this graphically. This is what the belief network is doing. It's taking this recursive decomposition and then specifying it using a graph, right? Using a graph to draw it. But now, you know, you're you're a Los Angeles resident and you know something about the way that burglaries and earthquakes work. Namely, you know that if you know whether or not the radio is broadcasting an earthquake warning. Whether or not it's really been an earthquake, whether or not you're really being verbal, you want to know something about whether or not your verbal alarm is ringing. Well, if you know whether or not you've been verbal and whether or not there's been an earthquake, you don't need to know what the radio is broadcasting to, work, to know about whether or not you're verbal. Like the radio is redundant. If you really know whether or not you've been verbal and whether or not there's really been an earthquake, the radio won't give you any useful additional information about whether or not your verbal alarm is going So now you've got the sufficient information for these two alarms. So we could make this conditional independence assumption, condition upon these two variables, I actually don't need to know R. So in other words, the alarm is conditionally independent of the radio given earthquake control. So it won't be true in every distribution, but we're from LA and we, we know what's going on there. This is what we say. Similarly, you could say, well, for this term, the second term, there, the R in R given EB, well, if you know whether or not there's been an earthquake and whether or not you've been verbal, whether or not the radio is going to broadcast an earthquake warning, surely it's not going to be depending on whether or not you personally verbal. I mean, the radio, you know, the earthquake forecast it doesn't really care about whether or not you personally been verbal. It's just, you know, don't, Really easy to so it's another condition of independence assumption. And suddenly you might say, well, we've got the, the third term, earthquake in the burglary. Well, you know, whether or not there's going to be an earthquake is completely independent of whether or not it's like the first burglary. So it's another condition of independence assumption which is very reasonable to make in this case. So in these assumptions, then I draw the solution, again, factorizes like this, but we've now got, you know, reduce sets of variables on the right hand side from the general one. And that we can represent in a, a belief network. Right? So this is saying, you know, the alarm depends only on burglary of an earthquake and not whether or not there's been a radio. Uh, similarly the radio depends only on the earthquake. Right? So this is uh, just helping you to graphically visualize the set of conditional independence statements that you have made about your problem. Now, that's, so that's nice, you know, so you could sort of reduce the, the burden of specification in this way, but you're still not done here. You don't have a distribution yet. You've only got a conditional independence structure. You need to specify the numerical values of these tables, these probability distributions. So you might say, uh, well, this one here, P and A can be, but I have to specify uh, if I've been verbal and it's been an earthquake, 
say the probability of the alarm is you know, a slight one. Uh, I've not been global, I've not been, I don't know, to the earthquake, probably the alarm's going to go up, it's very, it's very low, etc. So there are four states <coughs> here of B3. So for each of those four states, you have to specify the probability of uh, variable A. And the other variable state A, which is uh, zero, is given automatically by normalization. You know what that value is because it has to be one minus this value. So that's that's good. So we specified that. This uh, node here is specified. This one here we specified the table for that. So you can say, well, um, for example, if there's been an earthquake, for sure the radio is going to broadcast an earthquake. If it's not been one, then there's no way that will. Uh, So this is maybe a kind of poly system. So you still got to specify the probability of burglary and the probability of earthquake. So you might say probably a burglary, a aurora in, in your district in the <coughs> is one in a hundred, and probably the earthquake counting on your particular day is it's so simple. Now the question is, what you could do, so you specify the distribution now. You could ask the question. I come home, I see the burglar alarm is sounding, what's the probability I've been burgled? Right. So you get out your pen and pencil, and the paper pencil, and uh, you, you, work, you work it out. Right? So you want to know what is P of B given A? Well, how do you do that? I, you know, all that you know is the joint distribution B, E, A, and R. So you need to figure out how to get access to this quantity given A from the joint distribution. Well, how do you do that? You use your tools of conditional conditioning, marginalization, that's all that you will, will need to get this thing. So uh, it's going to be a base rule. This is going to be P of B and A or P of A states. The numerator B and A is the, is the margin of the joint distribution of the E and R. So the sum over E and R. And similarly, the denominator B of A is just the margin of the joint sum over B and R with A set and clapped in the specific state. And now we use the fact that your joint distribution factorizes under this assumption of independence. And then you just plug in whatever values you've got on your tables and you, you work it out. And you get some value not for that. So you're pretty fortunately sure that you know, you've been burgled when you hear that the burglar alarm is set. Now that you could go to your car and say, you know, I turn on the radio and then you find this, this broadcast an earthquake warning. Now what's the problem with the burglars? So you carry out a similar calculation and you find it's not for no one, something which is warning. These numbers, by the way, don't add up to one. Just it's unfortunate uh, coincidence. Okay, so this is kind of um, reasoning. So you know, we've now we've built this model with all these variables and interactions, there's some assumed independencies. And now you can infer, use that model as kind of uh, to answer questions of interest. That's that's the process of inference. Inference is the process of querying this model to answer questions. Of and we can do that just by repeated application of the rules of probability. Okay, so of course, you know, what we're going to want to do in, in general is we don't, we don't, we're not going to use like, you know, we're not going to do this all by hand anymore. You know, maybe it's an exercise you can go out and do this a couple of times and then you know, you get your marks, of course. But in general, of course, you know, we want to use a computer to do this kind of stuff automatically for us. Um, and part of this course is then how do you do that? How do you, particularly when it gets about thousands of or millions of variables, how do I use space for really that kind of marginalization in a great way? Okay, so that's kind of like, you know, we'll do that, uh, we'll start to think about that next week. But just to show you that this, there are many other extensions of this problem the framework which you can think about. So you could have, for example, uncertain e evidence where you might say, well, you know, did I really help here the burglar alarm? You know, maybe your neighbor phones you up and says, well, I think it's sounding, but I'm not really sure. 
think maybe she's a little bit hard of hearing, so you know, maybe you want to not say for sure that the alarm is sound. This is called uncertain or soft evidence. I don't want to say a lot about it, but um, one way to think about it is to, let's say, uh, you want to know that something about a variable X, you want to say some soft or uncertain evidence, let's say Y, tell them. And what I can do is I can, just using base rule, I can really express it this way. So what this means here is that if um, this would be a distribution, this Y tilde is, is, is a kind of notational thing. It's just simply to say that there will be a distribution over the states of the evidence. Here. So for example, if there's a binary variable here, um, if you know for sure what the state is, you know, absolutely hard, I know I definitely heard the, the burglar alarm sounding, and only one of these states of this probability vector will be one, and the rest will be zero. And when you sum over these states, then that would just simply select that P of X given that actual heart of the state. For the soft case, what will happen is you'll have a distribution of in those other components that vector which are non-zero. And you're simply averaging this probability with respect to those elements. Okay, so that's the, uh, and you can justify that using phase one. Yeah. Would that be a valid way to do hypothesis testing to deliberately impose you know, unrealistically high level of uncertainty on your evidence? And then it, if you're still getting a really positive answer at the other end, yeah, maybe do that. Well, I guess so. Um, I guess I. I <coughs> it's a, there's a difference between practice and theory. Right? In theory, I don't like that. Um, in practice, it may be a good thing to try. I mean, in some sense, you know, if you want to know what is the right answer in this framework, it says you take the. the I have a distribution over answers. Maybe, you know, I might have two models. I might be able to say this model is 10 times more likely than the other model. It equals zero. And that's it. That's the, then you would say, well, if I want to summarize that, I would therefore say take away maybe the most likely model. This question is to you know, with uh, stability or uh, they are interesting, but they're not actually in this framework in some sense. They are additional kind of subjective or desires or criteria which you might wish to impose in, in some way, but they're not really part of the framework. So the, the philosophical issues get less clear when you start thinking about this, which are pragmatically important potentially, but they are things I prefer not to think about in the moment, part of the design. And I'm going to try to give you the clean philosophical story, uh, and because the practice is not Um, yeah, I'm going to skip this Jeffers rule actually. Um, so please read about this. It's, a, it's examinable, but I, I don't want to miss it. <laughs> and uh, similarly, please read about uh, this. <laughs> Similar because I, this is not really. Uh, Okay, so you get the idea of a belief network. It's a way to specify condition independencies. Uh, also, where are these used? They're used an awful lot. So in prediction and machine learning, the a very high level picture, you want to say, given some inputs, you want to know what, say, the probability of the class level is. And we'll use all kinds of uh, models of belief networks to specify that. That's a discriminative generative predictor would say, well, the probability of class given the input is proportional to the probability input given the class, that's the probability of the class. So we'll make some kind of generative model, so if I knew what the class were, what would the input be? <coughs> How would the inputs be distributed? And we can then use Bayes rule to make the case The time series, uh, all the classical models of time series are belief networks, or all markup models, hidden markup models, 
with the regressive models and the analytical systems, all these standard um, models are representable as belief networks. So that's, uh, that's handy. In unsupervised learning, uh, they typically correspond to belief networks, uh, what are called latent variable belief networks, where you have some the cluster label or the underlying sort of structure of the, uh, the model is not directly specified, and what you specify, what you observe is some kind of marginal of this sort of larger model. We'll, we'll talk about that. And many, many, many more. So I mean, information theory again is another thing. <coughs> Physics, uh, all the classical models in so uh, many, many models in physics also can be represented as well. Now, so that's uh, five minutes. I just want to start giving you a flavor for this graph manipulation. So how does, how does to have the question is how does the concept of independence now relate to this graph structure? So let's imagine I give you a belief network which you know now is an encoding of independence assumptions. And I would ask you a question like, you know, are these two variables independent? So one thing you could do is you could use Bayes' rule to figure that out, which is in America maybe. But are the graph theoretic operations you can carry out which will tell you what the answer is? And the answer is yes, there are. And that's what we're going to think about now. So we need to understand a little bit what is the connection between these graph theoretic constructs and dependence or independence. So let's look at, uh, for the simplest case, we need to have three variables. So two variables is trivial. So the three variable case is the first non-trivial graph. We're going to look at DAX belief networks. And then look at all of the, the three variable DAX. So if I, which don't, was a one link missing. So if I had a, um, the reason I do that is if I had a diag like this, and I said, you know, what are the independent statements encoded by this diag? What is the answer? <coughs> A is independent B and C. Well, let's look what this says. This says P, we've got a term P of C given AB. We've got a term P B given A. We've got a term P of A. This is the this is the joint distribution P A B C. Okay. Now without much generality I can always write any joint distribution to variables to be say P of C given AB, P may B. There's no loss of generality. And if that's always doable. Sorry, do you have a number of hands? <coughs> quite a few units in the back here. trying to look at now is all of the DAGs, they have to be asymptotic DAGs. If 
which I can, you know, which is then valid, and which I can remove one edge. And there are four of them, and they're given like that. If you had four nodes, yeah. um, would, would you still need that, that disconnected? Um, because uh, the intermediate nodes have a tendency to be Well, if I go for four nodes, um, I can still write a DAG, which makes no additional dependency sometimes. I'll come back to this in a minute. But I just uh, want to, to say, and you should go away and think about this a bit more. So these are the four graphs here. So I kind of grouped them into two parts. My claim is that A, B, and C are all the same. And the only thing that's different is B. So A, B, and C, even though they've got different direction on, on these arrows, actually encode exactly the same condition of the statements. They're, they're all equivalent. And I do that by taking graph A. What is that? Um, I want to figure out what is A. In B, A, A, B, B, C, and I just use the, the structure of the graph to say, well, what that is, I've got an A given C term, B given C term, B, C, etc. So I find out that according to A, A and B, as it factorizes, are conditionally independent given C. And similarly, for graph B, I find the same, that A and B are conditionally independent given C. And similarly for C, Different arrows, but I find the same state again. They're condition independent given C. However, for D, if you work this out, you see that it's actually <coughs> there's no uh, reason that A and B are uh, independent given C. So this is kind of interesting. What it means is there's not a one-to-one -one mapping here. This one condition independent statement here. <coughs> Corresponding to three different kinds of graphs, three different belief networks, right? All including the same additional dependent statement. So I have a question. In B, you get placed down, I mean, the third, the third time in the numerator is um, P, B, given C. Yes. Right, I thought earlier you said um, that when you're using the graphs, um, any one node is the probability of, of um, itself given all of its ancestors, or was it just its parents? Just its parents. So, um, sorry, uh, yeah. isn't there any difference between the B, B and C graphs? No, they're all the same. Near the interpretation. In the exploitation? Uh, interpretation. Interpretation. No, they're the same. And at this level of discourse, they are the same. At another level, <laughs> <laughs> yes, in some sense, but not not, not at this basic level. But they, they, we can endow them with some uh, additional interpretation, but we will not do that in this case. But they are only the same if you consider the question of A B are conditions dependent on C. That's right. If so you they consider other questions, they would be the no, because. Um, the only, the only thing a belief network does is, is a, an encoding, a graphical encoding of independent statements. So once you check one possibility, yeah, yeah. that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Did you know what this is? In graph B, yeah. can we say A and B are independent? Unconditionally That's correct. Yes, so marginally they are unconditionally, they are, they are independent. Which is not the case for A and C. So that's true. So um, the next slide addresses that. So we can see here. Yeah, this is the marginal independence statements that you'll see. There's with these two graphs on the left, A and B are not marginal, not independent, unconditionally uh, independent. Whereas for D, they are. <coughs> okay, we've run out of time, folks. So we'll, uh, I'll see you on Friday. Oh, sorry. <coughs>